Okay, I think we are live. So uh, hello everyone and welcome back to the Latin American webinars on physics. My name is Joel Jones uh, from the PUCP in Peru and I will be your host this day. So uh, this is webinar number 91 and we are having uh, Tepe Katori as a speaker. Uh, so Katori-san carried out his PhD at Indiana University in Bloomington, which was followed by a postdoc at MIT. He then became assistant professor at Queen Mary University of London and is now associate professor at King's College London. Uh, so today, uh, Katori-san will give us an update on the CP violation measurements at T2K. And we're really happy to have him as a speaker today, given the fact that it's a very recent uh, publication. Uh, so before we begin, let me remind all of the viewers that you can ask questions and comments on the YouTube uh, live chat system. And these uh, questions will be passed on to Katori-san at the end of his talk. Uh, by the way, uh, we have already one comment on our chat, which is, uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry if I did, don't pronounce it correctly, it's Pruthi Mehta, who's saying hello, Tepe. <laughs> all right, so we're all yours, Tepe, please proceed. Okay, um, can you see me now? Uh, yeah. Hi, um, my name is Tepe. I'm from King's College. And uh, today I want to talk about uh, this uh, T2K new result. And uh, I think most of my talk is focusing on how T2K works. And then I go to a uh, result. So let's share my screen. Uh, this one, I think. OK. So, so this is today's my talk, the constraint on the matter antimatter symmetry vibration phase in neutrino oscillation. And so the result was published on Nature last week. And uh, the main result was, uh, uh, I come back later, so maybe I shouldn't say it now. But. So I want to describe uh, mostly to uh, how the oscillation experiment works. So then, so the neutrino oscillation experiment using the beam, you need uh, two things. The one is a beam and the other one is the detector. So I want to explain how this works in T2K and a little bit about the neutrino interaction physics. And finally, uh, moving to this oscillation result uh, and a little bit the future plan, which is SKGD and the T2K upgrade and the hyper -Camilla. Okay, so let's start from what the oscillation experiment is. So neutrino physics is a very, it's a big these days. It's a center stage of particle physics, which is, uh, the, 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 the two of the most uh, prestigious one happening is this uh, Nobel Prize, which was 2015. And uh, 2016, there was a breakthrough prize, which is awarded for uh, five experiment, K2K and T2K and Cameron, Diabay, and, and again, Snow and Super K, which also won Nobel Prize. So neutral physics is, uh, is very popular. The reason, oops, is that Neutrino physics offer you to measure something more. So now we know neutrino has a mass. So what we call standard model is actually this uh, stand neutrino standard model, which you mean the standard model plus three active massive neutrinos. And uh, by introducing massive neutrinos, you have uh, already new parameters. Okay, so this is different from looking for something new particle beyond the standard model, which you don't know you find or not, because these new parameters are something there and you can measure it. And among them, uh, maybe, um, so these are like unknown parameters. So many of them are already measured, but still there are several unknown parameters and maybe most interesting one is this uh, Dirac CP phase, which is the topic of today's talk. The second one is the one of mixing and the theta two three. This is the one, the first one measured with the high precision, but now uh, you have to measure uh, with the higher precision. The reason is because people used to measure sine two theta two three, but in a high precision neutrino experiment, you want to know the value of sine theta two three, then the, the, the degree of a 40 degree and a 50 degree uh, have to be differentiated because they're 
so it's coming back to the something we need to measure it. So in this moment, we don't know it's 40 or 50, basically. Uh, and another one is the mass ordering. So we know M3, uh, sorry, M1 is lighter than M2, but we don't know where the M3 is. It could be the heaviest, which makes sense for many people. So it's called the normal ordering. But maybe M3 is lighter than them, which is called inverted ordering, and we don't know yet. There are three other fun unknowns, which is we don't know neutrino the direct particle or Majorana particle. And if that is Majorana, there's a Majorana phases. And finally, we don't know the absolute neutrino mass. And that, those are something I don't talk today because they are not relevant for oscillation experiments. So you need a different experiment to measure it. And if you focus on the oscillation experiments, so many of them are designed around one to 10 GB, which I wanna also talk there. Okay, so formulation. So that the key is that, I wanna go very briefly. So neutrino flavor eigenstate, which is a mixing of uh, mass eigenstate. And you can parameterize this uh, uh, mixing matrix with the three mixing angle and uh, the one CP phase. And again, this uh, Majorana phases are not in the oscillation formula. Uh, and you can write down the oscillation formula in this way, which is a very generic way. Um, by the way, I also talk a lot for this uh, two flavor oscillation formula, which is simple and uh, it's not enough to describe delta CP, but it has a lot of insight how to design oscillation experiments. So that's how the two neutrino oscillation formula looks like, including uh, uh, the, the, the mass and the angle, okay? <laughs> The formula we focus on is uh, this is the first order of uh, delta CP. So now this uh, the Yarskog invariant is in uh, uh, oscillation formula, and especially this is a formula for a new mu to new e oscillation. So minus signs for neutrino and the plus signs for anti-neutrino. So if there is no CP violation, so if the JCP is zero, uh, you see the same for this oscillation, and the difference comes as a CP violation. And as a scale, it's not that small if you see this way. So it's a plus minus 25% changes of your oscillation probability when you fix your baseline to be 295 kilometers, which is T2K experiment, basically. So it's a 25% effect and you might think it's big, but if you see the scale, so we are talking 5% oscillation becomes 6% or something like that's the order. So it's kind of small. Uh, so expected oscillation probability is in general small. So that's a um, better statement. So in the neutrino mode, you expect uh, enhancement of uh, oops, cross section when this uh, delta is minus pi over two. And uh, anti-neutrino, uh, you expect the suppression if the delta is minus pi over two. And if the delta is pi over two, you see the suppression of neutrino oscillation and you see enhancement of anti-neutrino oscillation. So that's the kind of effect you want to see it. Um, so this is uh, an um, overview of like uh, all oscillation experiment. And uh, the present experiment include the T2K, Nova, Microboon, Deep Core, things like that. And the future one include the Hyper-K, Dune, Pingu, Orca. Um, and there are a few class of experiment I don't talk, which is a coherent or reactor or so on. And what is striking here is that all experiment is around one to 10 GeV. Uh, the reason you can imagine this way. So if you want to see neutrino oscillation, you wanna make this phase part of your oscillation to be around the uh, um, one or pi over two. And the delta M square is like a 10 to minus three EV square. So which makes L over E to be around 500 kilometer per GeV. And we don't have a many choice for this value because if the error is really big, if the error is big, then experiment, your detector is far away and your flux go down. So you don't want to that, then you need a more neutrinos. So you, you want to make error to be not too far away, but if the error is small, then your E has to be small. But if the E goes smaller, then the cross section goes smaller. So your interaction rate go down. So you have to adjust these two parameter L and E and uh, you find the only few nice combination. So T to K, the area is 300 kilometer and E is 0.6 GB. And the NOVA area is 800 kilometer is 2 GB. So in this way, every oscillation experiment end up around one to 10 GB. But 
one to 10 GB is also the region, your cross section has a big systematics. That comes later. Okay, so how do you measure oscillation? For the data, you create a neutrino beam and you measure it. But you measure twice. The first is you measure by near detector. So that's how you find the neutrino flux before the oscillation. Um, so that this measurement is focusing on mu muon neutrino to electron neutrino. So I pretty much only talk that one. So you measure muon neutrino at the near detector. And a far detector, the electron neutrino, which is a signal of muon neutrino oscillation, uh, but also you measure muon neutrino to uh, constrain of systematics. So that's what you measure for data. And the simulation, you want to simulate the situation. The first is you want to simulate neutrino flux, and then both near and far detector. And then you simulate neutrino interaction, both near and the far detector. And then you want to simulate detector response. And finally, you apply oscillation formula to see how this detector response change at the far detector. So now you have uh, this uh, description of the experiment by simulation. So the oscillation analysis is to compare this data and simulation, and you find the right parameter from this uh, simulation is. Uh, so meantime, near detector information used to constrain systematic. So that's the uh, overview of this data simulation and oscillation analysis. So from here, I want to explain uh, these elements one by one. Uh, but so that's an overview of T2K. So T2K is a Tokai to Kamioka experiment. It's created neutrino beam at the J Park, and these neutrino propagate roughly 300 kilometer uh, underground because you have to take into account the coverage of the Earth. So you, you shoot neutrino to the downward. And this is measured by Super Kamioka and detector, which is a far detector. All right. So let's start from neutrino beam. So this is a J Park which is very close from the beach. Um, it's, it's okay beach, not the best beach you can imagine. But um, So the, the first you have to accelerate protons, uh, start from Linux, which is a 400 MeV, the linear machine. And these protons are sent to RCP, rapid cycling synchrotron, up to 3 GB. And then this is sent to a main ring, which is 30 GB. Um, and these protons are finally extracted for the beam line and collide to the target to generate a neutrino beam all the way to Kamioka. So the, the primary beam line is all protons. Okay, so the neutrino beam line starts from protons. Uh, so there are 30 GB protons and the main ring. And this is the structure. Is. So these protons make the pulse. Each pulse is a roughly five microsec width. And each pulse are separated 2.45 seconds. So every 2.45 seconds, there's a one shot of a five microsecond pulse. But this five microsecond pulse also has a microstructure, which is eight bunches. That's what you see from here. Um, and you can see it these from the neutrinos. So these are structure of the protons, but that's how you generate neutrinos. So neutrino maintain the same timing structure. So it's a left plot. This is the near detector information. So this is the measurement of near detector about neutrinos. And you see it's eight peaks. It's these eight bunches on each pulse. And after 300 kilometer propagation, you see the same timing structure at Super Kamiokande, which also shows eight bunches. So these pulses are uh, uh, the standard technique for this kind of experiment to suppress the background because you know the beam is only five microsecs. So, so the chance cosmic ray comes in pretty low. All right. So that's how the picture is. is. Uh, so the proton is accelerated in the main ring. And once you reach to the enough energy, it's extracted to this uh, beam line and send it to and bend and collide to the target and it generate a neutrino and send it to Kamioka. Um, so once the proton is extracted, now it's a secondary beam line, which is a generation of neutrinos. So the way you generate neutrinos is following. So the first protons collide to the graphite, the graphite target. And this target is located inside of the home one. So something like that. 
And this collision makes a shower of mesons. And these mesons decay to neutrinos, okay? However, this horn has a current uh, and which generates a magnetic, uh, the toroidal field. So neutrino mode, they are generating the field so that you focus the positive mesons and defocus negative mesons. The purpose is in this way, you can increase the flux roughly 17 times. Uh, and also you reduce the background coming from the negative, negative meson decay. And for anti-neutrino mode beam, you switch the direction of the current, and then you focus negative mesons and the defocus positive mesons. So magnetic horn is, is, a, is a vital for neutrino experiment because by this device, you know, the experiment takes 17 years, will become one year, right? Because you increase flux 17 times. But also it's a, such an extreme device. And you see from this uh, picture, uh, cartoon, so these devices are located in the room of helium, uh, one meter of concrete block, and then the two meter of iron blocks because it's highly radioactive. And the operation of this device also takes extreme uh, 250 kiloamp current, which also generates huge noise. I just, I wanna show it. So this is the testing of one of the horn in the laboratory. And uh, I want to show the, how the sound is. So this is the sound of a neutrino, basically. Let's see if we can do this. So you see the hit every 2.5 seconds. So that's the moment when the current pass through and it generated this uh, 1.7 Tesla field to focus the mesons. So that's happened. Um, every 2.5 seconds in our experiment. Okay, so that's how you make neutrinos. Um, there are a few more tricks. The one is this uh, off axis beam. So these neutrino beam are designed to, uh, so the experiment is designed slightly off from the, the direction of the protons. And the reason is because in this way, you can narrow your spectrum. So this black histogram, it's the on axis spectrum of neutrinos. But if you go a little bit far away from the axis, the spectrum will become narrower. And in this way, you can maximize uh, the peak at the location of uh, oscillation maximum. So that's, so the experiment become more sensitive for oscillation. So that's the first thing we do. Uh, and how do you predict this neutrino flux is pretty important, even though we measure that near detector. And prediction is, uh, I, I shouldn't say impossible, but it's very difficult because it's a, it's a, it's a hadron physics, type of hadron physics. And the way we do is we use the data from the, um, the hadron measurement. So we trust what we measured more than the, the simulation. And there is an experiment at CERN dedicated for T2K, which is called NA61 Shine. So in this experiment, they have a target we use at T2K and they actually measure the distribution of mesons. And we use this information for our simulation to improve our flux prediction calculation. Okay, so that's a summary of our neutrino beam. So in this data for today's result, we have a, this 1.5 times 10 to 21 POT, POT standard for protons on target for neutrino mode and a similar number of anti-neutrino mode data. So this figure shows how we accumulate the POTs. And this histogram in the bottom describes the neutrino flux prediction. So that for the neutrino mode, the, the flux is dominated by mu neutrino, which is 97% dominant at flux peak. And the anti-neutrino mode, on the other hand, which is dominated by a muon anti-neutrino beam, which is 96%. Uh, there are small contamination for uh, uh, the opposite sign of neutrinos, opposite, so anti-neutrino for neutrino mode and uh, neutrino in anti-neutrino mode. Um, and also there is an electron neutrino. This is important because electron neutrino is background. So we want to uh, understand this distribution carefully. Um, and uh, error is roughly 
And this era is dominated by the prediction of hadrons. So all, all era is associated with how we transport this hadron measurement at the shine experiment to T2K. And in the future, we are expecting the reduction of this era down to 5%. So that's an ongoing issue. Okay, now the detector. So before moving to the uh, far detector, so neutrinos are measured by near detector. The so one is uh, in grid, which is on axis, and the other one is ND280, which is off axis. So in grid is mainly for monitoring of neutrino flux. And the ND280, which is off axis, which means it's on the same line of far detector. So we use this ND280 data to uh, constrain uh, it's a variety of uh, different systematics. Okay, let me talk Ingrid first. So Ingrid, which is an array of 60 modules and all of them are roughly one meta cube detector. And uh, it's a scintillator of, um, the, it's a sandwich scintillator of scintillator and iron track. And by using Ingrid, we can monitor the flux uh, distribution um, nominal accuracy around 0.1 millirad. So you see this figure, this one shows distribution of a flux with a different location of Ingrid for both horizontal and vertical direction. So these 60 modules are distributed in uh, several meters away. Um, and this data shows how the Ingrid, the, the, the track looks like. Maybe this is a new one from real neutrinos. Oh, by the way, in this talk, I mentioned scintillator many times. But when I say scintillator, it usually mean an organic plastic scintillator with uh, fiber reading and uh, silicon PM, CPM reading. So that's kind of standard for this community these days. Um, okay, so this on axis site, now we have a lot of other detectors because there's a lot of space. So one is a proto module, which is a fully active module, unlike uh, Ingrid. And Wagashi is a water target 3D scintillator array uh, coming with a baby mind, which is a magnetized tracker made by CERN. Uh, we also have an emergent detector, it's called Ninja. So these are all, all variety of RMD and future detectors. The off axis detector may be more important, which is the ND280. So ND280 is a combination of many detectors, and the, the purpose is you want to measure like all the detail and the different topology of uh, neutrino interactions and use this information to constrain the both flux and the cross-section systematics for this oscillation analysis. So I want to give you some example. So this is an example of, uh, it's called FGD1 CC one pi sample. So this means neutrino is interacting with FGD, which is a scintillation, scintillator tracker and it produced charged lepton and a pion. So you see this a trajectory. So this is a candidate event display. So the heat happened at the FGD and uh, this trajectory is tracked by the TPC, two of the gas TPCs. And all of them are in the magnet. So you can measure the momentum. And the left histogram describes the uh, data and uh, with the simulation. And the simulation has a different channel. So you see the contribution of a different channels for this particular topology. So this is a one of 14. And so we have another 13 samples that look similar, but different topology. So the, the right histogram, this is a CC zero pi. So in this case, the outgoing track is just for a charged lepton, so no pion. Uh, and you see the differences. So the left plot, when the, the case you generate pions, uh, of course, the dominant contribution is uh, the baryonic resonance pion production, which is this uh, green contribution. And the right plot, if you don't see the pion, the dominant contribution is the CCQE, which is a signal channel. So the, the trick we use is uh, we perform this kind of many different measurement um, simultaneously so that we understand the contribution of uh, each channel and also the error associated for each uh, interaction mode. Uh, okay, so that's the energy to And now moving on to the fire detector. 
So the fire detector is, a, um, I said, maybe famous super Kamiokande detector, which is a 50 kiloton water Cherenko detector. Uh, it's famous because it got Nobel Prize 2015. And maybe people are familiar with this, uh, how it looks like inside. So this one is a picture of the inner detector where the 11,000 of 20 inch PMT is surrounded and 20 inch PMT is I mean 50 centimeter roughly. So you see how big it is if you compare with myself. Um, oh, and also in case you never heard of PMT. So PMT stands for photomultiplier tube. So it's a standard device to detect photons. So using a photoelectric effect, you can convert a photon to an electric current. Um, so that inner detector is something you see it in the picture. Um, but this inner detector is inside of the bigger tank. And there is a region, it's called the outer detector is. And that region also has a 2008 inch PMTs and to reject the background. So you see these uh, eight inch PMT attached with uh, wavelength shifting plates. Um, and in this region, unlike the inside, you want to maximize the reflection so that you can detect any kind of background. So everything is covered with a white Tyvek reflectors. So that's how um, Super Kamiokande looks like. And uh, the, well, our measurement is the time and the charge information from all PMTs. And by using them, you can perform a particle identification, a PID, and also you can reconstruct kinematics. So you see this uh, pattern. Um, so electron neutrino, if the electron neutrino interact, which makes a fuzzy ring, fuzzy triangle ring. Uh, so that's how the electron neutrino like. And then when the muon neutrino interact with the water molecule, it makes a sharper triangle ring. So the heat pattern makes a ring, but it looks cleaner. So in this way, you can even tell what kind of particles are. Um, and also from the distribution of these uh, hits, you can reconstruct the energy of the particle and the scattering angle. And once you know the energy and the scattering angle, you can reconstruct neutrino energy is. So that's this formula is. Um, because neutrino oscillation, eventually you use neutrino energy. So you need to reconstruct neutrino energy. So it's a, it's a multiple of steps. So you measure the hits of photon and you reconstruct energy and the scattering angle of charged lepton. And then finally you can reconstruct neutrino energy. And the right is the, the data distribution with the, with the function of a PID. Um, for electron neutrino measurement, which is a signal of a muon neutrino oscillation, uh, there, there are um, two major backgrounds. The so one is this uh, intrinsic background, because even you measure the electron neutrino, some of them are contamination from the beam. And that's roughly, um, it's only 0.5% of the whole beam, the flux, but in the event, which is roughly 10%. And the second one is a miss ID background, because this kind of water chunk of detector, you can't distinguish um, electron with the photons. So once you generate gamma ray, uh, it's mis-ID as electrons. So which means this mis-ID as an oscillation signal. And the majority of these them are coming from some kind of neutral current interaction. So that's what you see this yellow histogram. And the most common one is this neutral current pi zero production. So if you generate a pi zero by neutral current, and then if you, if you miss to detect one of gamma ray, then you see the single gamma ray from neutral interaction. So it's um, misidentified as an oscillation signal. And that's also contribute another 10% of uh, the old new E. Okay, so that's how um, detector works. Um, so, uh, let me talk a little bit more uh, that the, the details about interactions. So as I mentioned, neutrino interact and uh, generate charged leptons. And that's how you find the neutrino energy. And the main channel for this process is called CCQE, the charge current quasi-elastic scattering. And it's a pretty simple. For the case of the neutrinos, neutrino interact with neutrons and generate charged leptons and protons. Um, 
And once you know this interaction in CCQE, you can reconstruct neutral energy. So there is some assumption. So, and this assumption I call a QE assumption. And the first is this target neutron at rest. And the second assumption is, yes, this is the CCQ interaction. Because when you reconstruct the neutron energy, you are using the information, it's a two body interaction. And if you see the data, so this is a, again, the cross section data from the world and the way the T2K experiment is, you see that the data has a quite a big error bar. So it's the simplest interaction, but still not the uh, greatest measurement in the world. The reason is because of all kinds of nuclear effect. And so that was the first pointed out by this uh, Martini et al. And what this paper suggested was neutrino interact with the nucleon. That's the one case. But not so rare case is that the neutrino interact with uh, two nucleons together. So there's a, some kind of a correlation between nucleons uh, also contribute for interaction. And what is more, this kind of a correlation change cross section up to 30%. So that's what's showing by this uh, plot. Um, it's the data from Miniboon and the, the Martini et al. explained this Miniboon data pretty well by this idea. Um, so now, um, this is another cartoon. So neutrino is act sometimes interacting, not one nucleon, but the pair of nucleon protons, okay? And in the Cherenkov detector, we don't measure these protons because they are below Cherenkov threshold. So you can't tell from the data. And so this is an important background and new type of background. So now we have a huge community effort. So both nuclear cellists and experimentalists are trying to understand uh, the, this kind of phenomena and predict correctly. Because the only way to reject this is we need the better model. So, so this, CC, this is whole business is called CCQ puzzle. And at the point of last year, yeah, so this, uh, at, there are lots of advanced nuclear models and those more or less describe minimum data well. So we understand the role of these nuclear correlations, but the nuclear correlations, but still we can't really fix the parameters completely. So this gives an uh, error and we need to be aware of it. Um, and for the, this analysis, we use this uh, Valencia 2P2H model the, from the, the group at IFIC in Valencia. Uh, another important channel is the pion production, uh, which is a similar reason. So when the neutrino interact with the nucleon and produce charged lepton, so that's I call signal, but sometimes neutrino interact and produce uh, charged lepton and pion, that's the background. That's fine because you can reject it. The problem happened if you can't measure this pion and uh, not so small chance, this pion disappear inside of the nucleus. It's a nuclear effect called pion absorption. Um, and this kind of nuclear effect, it's called the final state interaction, have to be modeled correctly. Because again, this is the background, we have to simulate. So, so the case of a neutrino disappearance, the dip of oscillation give you the amplitude of your oscillation or mixing angle. And the location of the dip is the phase of oscillation, which is a neutrino mass, right? So the location of this dip or excess is very important. But uh, if you have a background, which is not the quasi-elastic, then this background migrate in this region of dip so you have to predict. So that's a very important background to understand. Um, the situation is not great. So this pion model, we have a variety of models and uh, uh, FSIs, uh, but we don't have a complete understanding. So the Minerva experiment at Fermilab, which is probably the most advanced experiment on this subject, uh, measured four different channels, and they try to simultaneously fit all the parameters but it didn't work quite well. So there is a still ongoing issue. Um, and it's a right figure explain why this is so difficult. So this is the comparison of one of a simulation called the Jibu with the pi zero production data, okay? But if you see the cross section, the red is data. So the blue band 
is a simulation without any FSI. Well, first things happen is the pion absorption. So around the location of delta peak, the pion disappeared, okay? And inside of the nucleus, pion rescatter and energy go lower. So the peak of the cross section shifts to the lower region. So that's the second thing that happened, pion scattering. But finally, some of the pi zero are coming from pi plus because of the charge exchange. So yeah, you needed to predict both pi zero and pi plus and all of these process correctly. And then finally your data and simulation agreed. So Minerva tried to do this by measuring all channels and uh, yeah, it didn't, uh, it was very tricky. Uh, okay, so, so that's the situation is. So this uh, right figure shows uh, our, the simulation of a neutrino interaction and the predicted errors. And what you see is error is quite big and the blue band is the location of the T2K experiment in the region. So the error is quite big. So all you have to do is that you need your own data uh, to constrain these. And this subject is quite popular. So now we have a chapter in the PDG and there's a new collaboration called the NewStack, which I'm also the member is. Um, and we try to promote this uh, theory experimental collaboration to understand neutrino cross section needs. Okay, so moving on the results. So um, the, the, the first step is to uh, tune our model. So the, our neutrino interaction model is tuned from the external data, like Miniboom, Minerva, Cyboom, K2K, Minos, and Bubble Chambers. And, and this right figure is what we get. But this is a too big error. So we have to use the internal data from ND280 to constrain all parameters. And so this is very important for us. And you see this figure on the right bottom, one of the example. Uh, so as I said, this FSI parameters, like amount of pion absorption or rescattering inside of the nucleus, so these are all process have 30, 40% of errors, but by using these 14 different sample from ND280, these errors go to less than half. So 10 to 20%. And after by using all these samples, uh, so the, the errors suppress more than half. So for example, electron-like ring measurement, so without, without the internal constraint, the error is 17%. But with this uh, ND20 um, simultaneous fit, the error go to 9%. So this is a vital for systematic error suppression. Okay, so now is the uh, measurement. So this is a distribution of uh, electron neutrino candidate. So which I mean electron candidate. And the top figure is for um, neutrino mode and the bottom figure is for anti-neutrino mode. Um, all right, I see the typo. So this is a say, should, should say minus pi over two. So what you can see from here is that for neutrino mode, you see the data is higher than the simulation. So you see some kind of enhancement. In anti-neutrino mode, the statistics is a bit low, but now you see the suppression needs. And this is what we expect when your CP violation phase is negative. Uh, so the, in the table, you see that um, the, the total prediction is 73% um, using in, including a CP vibration uh, and the data is 75. And for anti-neutrino, the prediction is around 17 and the data is 15. Uh, so that's five, this is the last plot for this oscillation analysis. So oscillation analysis, we fit uh, all oscillation parameters. And our interest is three parameters, delta CP and sine square theta two three and delta M square three two. So this has a flat prior. And other oscillation parameters uh, coming from our external constraint. So which means these are PDG and Gaussian error. So the top figure shows X axis is the delta CP and Y axis is sine square theta one three. Uh, it's a bigger contour is the case if we don't use theta one three information from the reactor neutrinos. 
But once we use this external constraint, you have a, this a smaller contour, this one. Uh, and these are one sigma contour. The bottom of figure shows x axis is a delta CP again, and y axis is a sine square theta to three. And uh, you see this a uh, three sigma contour, it's a big one. Uh, so the, the, this is the bottom line of this analysis is because we used to see three sigma spreading to the whole space, but now the three sigma contour also the closed. So which means now uh, if you increase your statistics, you can make this contour smaller and smaller and eventually you can find the right values. Um, the one caveat is, so it's a three sigma contour is closed, but this three sigma contour also includes zero. So that zero is still the one of the option in the three sigma. So that is also shown this uh, on the figure in the, the, this left side. So this is our best measurement and this is the three sigma contour. Right? Um, uh, we also tested the mass hierarchy. The way we do is we just oscillate uh, the fit separately, assuming a normal ordering and inverted ordering. And uh, we have a small, the weak preference of the normal ordering with the 89% of the posterior probability. So that's uh, our oscillation result. And in my last uh, few minutes, I wanna talk about the future. Uh, the first thing is the SKGD. Uh, so Super Camille Kande is planned to be doped with 0.1% uh, of gadolinium. And the main purpose is, so this gadolinium has a high cross section and uh, uh, large Q value. So it's a very um, sensitive for neutron capture. So basically Super Camille Kande become uh, visible for neutrons. And in this way, you can measure neutral current at low energy, especially for DSNB. And our target is this uh, 10 to 20 MeV region. And we have enough sensitivity. So we expect few events per year by this 0.1% uh, of gadolinium, which is um, ongoing. Um, but this gadolinium is also useful for oscillation analysis because there are more neutrons for anti-neutrino, uh, no, sorry. So more neutrons from the neutrino interactions. Um, the one with the big background for anti-neutrino event are neutrinos. So I, let, let me go back here. So the so bottom figure is the anti-neutrino mode data and the red is uh, uh, this oscillation signal from uh, anti-muon neutrinos, but it also contains a lot of interactions coming from neutrinos. So these are background and you want to suppress and the neutrino interaction makes more neutrons in a final state. So you can't distinguish electrons and positrons from the data, but by measuring the amount of neutrons, you can find it's a charge is a neutron, uh, neutrino or anti-neutrino. So this shows the case, you know, by assuming that zero neutron or more than one neutron, and you see how the background is suppressed. So, so this SKGD is not only astrophysics, but also it's a great for oscillation experiment. But now Super Camille Kande is not pure water and gadolinium. So you want to make sure there's no leak because we have a big leak. So last year, uh, two years ago, we have a big campaign to fix the wall of uh, Super Camille Kande and same time replace all the dead PMT. Um, and now we confirm there's no leakage anymore. So we are ready to dope gadolinium. So that was a um, fun time for all of us to work in the inside of Super Kanyo Kande. Um, the meantime, there's a T2K upgrade is planned. So there are two parts. The one is this uh, JPAC neutrino beam upgrade. Uh, the main part is this uh, repetition. So this moment that each pulse comes every 2.48 seconds, but we want to make it twice faster. And the, the key is that we need a better power supply. Um, so this test is ongoing. And we are hoping to reach to this uh, 1.3 megawatt power at 2028. The another thing is the upgrade of near detector. So this pod detector, which I didn't discuss today, is replaced, replaced with the new detectors 
the one is so-called Super FGD. It's a three-dimensional and scintillation tracker. And uh, it has a very high resolution you see from this picture. I mean, of course, it's a simulation. Um, and also there is a new TPC, the gas TPC, and uh, you allow to measure like a high, high scattering angle event. So we're expecting this to um, come soon and then uh, it's a better near detector data. But the, our great goal is this one, Hyper Kamiokande. So Hyper Kamiokande is a bigger water tank. So the first generation was a Kamiokande, it's a three kiloton. And the second generation is a Super Kamiokande, it's a 50 kiloton. And the third generation Hyper Kamiokande is a 260 kiloton. So the construction started from this year. Um, so that's great. And physics is also great. It's an MEB to TEB physics. Uh, covering all kinds of neutrinos and uh, all kinds of new physics. So it's a Nobel Prize go to Kamio Kande on 2002 and 2015 for Super K. So now you can do a, um, some kind of linear extrapolation when you get the Nobel Prize for Hyper K. So Hyper K has an um, oscillation program to cover all of them. The first is that we have a chance to reach the five sigma delta CP measurement. Um, and in this stage, we are limited with the systematics errors. So that's another reason we want to uh, focus on this uh, cross-section systematics because that's a dominant. So the, the, we need a bigger detector and more statistics, but also we need to reduce systematic error. The mass ordering uh, is not easy by beam because uh, the matter effect is weak, but we expect from atmospheric neutrino to find a mass ordering. And also we can measure theta two, three. So basically, Hyper-K can find all of oscillation parameters. The other physics is also great, the solar neutrinos. Uh, so the, we have a new high quantum efficiency PMTs, but the, the dark rate is a bit higher. So the work is ongoing to reduce dark rate. And also there is a new type of the module, it's called MPMT, and it's the prototype is. So this is motivated by KM3Net, uh, is ongoing to be developed. Um, the proton decay work is great, uh, both the pion channel, epi channel, and the new k channel. Hyper k will be the better than anybody else. Um, and also, there are many other channels to measure. And finally, for supernova neutrinos, so the, now the hyper k reached to the mega parsec. So we can cover the supernova explosion at Andromeda, but uh, we also try to extend all the way to M81. Then you can see the supernova neutrino almost every year. So the future of T2K and SKGD and T2K upgrade and hyper candy, I think all of them looks very bright and great. So let's make to my conclusion. So T2K is a second generation long based neutrino oscillation experiment in Japan. So neutrino is from JPARC and measured by SuperK. So in this analysis, the data from 2009 to 2011 was used and the oscillation shows asymmetric behavior. So you see the enhancement for neutrino mode and the separation for anti-neutrino mode. And this can be interpreted as a negative CP violation phase. And as data shows, uh, this is a preferred region and you see the closed three sigma contour. And we have a, um, a lot of future plans, including SKGD and T2K upgrade and Hyper Kamiokande, and uh, all of them are ongoing project. So uh, thank you for your attention. Okay, so let's see if my video can start. Okay, thank you, thank you so much uh, for for the talk. Uh, let's see, I'm going to exit full screen and uh, okay, great. So uh, it's uh, it was a very interesting talk. Thank you so much for um, for uh, giving us such a good talk in such a short amount of time. Uh, so now, uh, okay. So before we go to the to the audience in in YouTube, uh, since they they probably have a, a little bit of a lag, let's let's go for questions with the audience. Would anybody here in the audience on the webinar audience would like to to make any questions? I have a couple. Let's see if the others have any. Really? Not even Roberto. I don't believe this. <laughs> so let me see. I, I, I wrote a, a couple of questions myself. Um, 
So, so okay, so, so since we're already on, um, since you showed your result uh, lately, could you, could you go back to your previous slide? Uh, where you see, where you show your main result, so mm -hmm. so there the 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 the, the, the interval for in, inverted ordering is is much uh, smaller, and that one does reject um, CP yeah. conservation. But it, I, I assume that is because uh, the minimum chi squared um, for inverted ordering is is larger, so so then it opens up. Uh, it doesn't have such much. Uh, space to open up before you do the, the, the cut on the three sigmas? Yeah, um, I think um, my understanding is much simple because the data, what happened for our main result, we see too many neutrinos. Mm -hmm. So our enhancement is maximum possible. And this maximum possible mean you have a three combination. Delta CP is minus pi over two and a normal hierarchy and uh, upper octans. You know, so you are using all three parameters to maximize um, oscillation needs. So mm -hmm. some, thing, some sense we are too lucky or we should be careful. It's because our result is stronger than sensitivity. So, so that inverted is the same reason. Yeah, we prefer normal because we see too many neutrinos. I see. Yeah. I see. Okay. So, uh, okay. Uh, I don't know if there's any other questions. I, I, ha I have a couple more, but um, let's let's start with the with the with the chat. Uh, so there's a lot of people saying hello, hello, hello. So apparently. You have a lot of fans. <laughs> so the first question comes from Victor Valera, who asks, what is the 1E, 1DE new mode? Ah, yes. So that's it's something I didn't discuss. It's a, it's a bit controversial, let's say. So, um, so the measurement, the oscillation signal are electroneutrino. So electron neutrino CC candidate are the, uh, sorry, electron, ele so if you measure electrons that's interpreted electron neutrinos for neutrino mode and the uh, same with for anti-neutrino. However, sometimes you, we can also measure the pion and we also use this as a signal. So, and these pions, the way we measure pion in a super kamiokande, you can't measure the track but pi on, pi plus decay and generate another electrons, decay electrons. So DE stands for decay electrons. So 1E, 0DE mean you only see one single isolated electrons, which mean electron neutrino candidate and uh, anti-neutrino mode is the same things. And 1E, 1DE mean you measure electrons and high energy electron track, but uh, after you see low energy electrons coming from muon decay. And this one indicate there's a production of pions. So we also use this channel in this oscillation, but this contribution is pretty weak. So I would say this sample didn't contribute. Um, and you see the, the result is. So we expect around a five event for this one E one DE. And what we measure is 15. So we, we measured um, too much of this. And uh, I would say this is a statistical error, but we'll see for more data. Super. So let's see if, uh, let's see. Alfredo Aranda is asking me to mute my mic. We already did. <laughs> so let's see, Pablo Miguel Cifuentes. Uh, so, Pablo Miguel Cifuentes is asking, uh, what is the results? So, so, so there's a question of basically uh, why, uh, uh, so let me translate the question a little bit. Uh, so, so why, the question is why can't you distinguish Majorana neutrinos in these experiments? Uh, no? 
what what's the, what is the difference for Majorana and Dirac? I think uh, they that all week major is the charge left on, and uh, they, there's no signature, and uh, there's uh, no difference in the oscillation formula. So that's the main reason. Um, there is a uh, well. In this moment, uh, neutrino-less double beta decay is the uh, only possible experiment to see the difference. Um, there are a few people suggesting some scattering experiments because they have a different current. So theoretically, if you have a um, highest precision, you can measure difference. But in a realistically, it's uh, it's impossible. Great. Let's see. Um... We have we have a lot of, of, of questions on the on the chat. Uh, before before we do that, let me do let me ask one more, one one question. Um, so 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 you you mentioned the um, the background from neutral uh, neutral current interactions, right? Which uh, come from uh, the uh, production of a pion, which will decay into into photons, right? Uh, however, in in uh, right that that that's perfect. So, however, when when you have a charged lepton, right, you you are generating a ring, not a couple of photons, right. So 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 my question is, how come do the do the pions are such a background for you if if they're just emitting two photons? Ah, so if you measure two photons, fine. Then you can reject. But uh, the chance pi zero makes only one photon, it's not small. And uh, it, so the, the main reason is uh, just the kinematics. So if the pi zero decay and uh, pi zero is boosted to the direction of one of a photon, then the energy of one photon goes zero and all energy goes to other photon. So the pi zero naturally decay to a single photon. So we always have this background and uh, the only way is, yeah, we, you need to predict. And sometimes um, decay, the one photon is, you know, it's not easy to detect or, you know, there, there, are, there are several reasons, but major reason is this uh, asymmetric de decay. And we try to reject as much as possible, but there are some contamination. Um, and there's, sure. a, oh, sorry. sorry. Uh, so there's another minor process, which is, uh, Sometimes the delta directly decay to a photon. And this process has a very small cross section, like a 10 to minus 41 centimeter square at 600 MeV. So previously nobody cared, but now we came to the enough sensitivity. So this situation, the radiative decay of delta is also the background. And uh, it's like a 20, 30% of this pi zero case. Sure, but but my understanding was it that, that the charged lepton coming out from the from the neutrino interaction would not generate one photon; it would generate like a series of photons that would be distributed like a ring. Ah, okay. So so that's a, a different uh, photon. So I, I say photon background mean a gamma ray, and this gamma ray makes a electromagnetic style of Cherenkov ring. So the one gamma ray makes uh, uh, the ring of photons which looks like this uh, case of uh, new ECC. So that's, that's why it's background. And the charged lepton, yes, it's generated a photon, the chain ring, but that makes a sharp ring. So, so that's why you can distinguish it. I, I see, so, so that photon from the, from the pion will eventually rescatter and produce a, the ring. Yeah, that looks like uh, electron neutrinos. I see, I see, thank you, thank you. Okay, so let's go uh, back to the to the chat. Um, so Victor Valera comes back and he's asking to explain antimatter asymmetry through leptogenesis. How large is the CP phase expected to be? Uh, this is because a small CP phase in the quark sector is too small to explain it. I. I let any theorist in here to answer for that question. So I, my, my quick answer is I, I don't know. And actually even, I'm not sure this statement that quark sector is too small and left side is big, but I think I agree. We don't know how small is small and how big is big. Do we, do we know that? Well, 
I, I, I think that you can you can uh, uh, quantify that the that uh, the CP relation in the pork sector is too small. Maybe somebody else in the audience has a better idea. Uh, but my my understanding is that you cannot uh, link the CP violation on the neutrino sector with directly with that in le in leptogenesis processes. But may maybe somebody else in the audience can 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 give us. A... So so that was uh, by the way I, I want to say one more word. So that was uh, one of the main uh, question for this result. Um, so we 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 are very careful to state in the paper. So we. Sorry. So we said, um, we don't say the delta CP of a lepton sector is the solution of leptogenesis and uh, baryon asymmetry. It's, it's this connection have to be clarified by theory or model, I think. Yeah, I, I agree. Okay, so let's see. Um... Let's see. So Pierre Lazorac is saying, hi, Tepe, can you explain the sensitivity to uh, SN plot on your last slide? I don't know what the SN, maybe supernova. What's the SN plot? Oh, maybe this one. So what is the question about? So the, the question is, uh, let me, can you explain the sensitivity ah, to okay. S okay, in plot on your last slide? Yeah, so, sorry, yeah, I, I didn't explain anything. So this is the probability to see um, how many neutrinos from the this supernova happening at a certain distance. And the black line is more than one neutrino detection. And the blue is more than three neutrino detection and the green is the two. And uh, each line is uh, a different oscillation scenario. So if you require only one neutrino observation, then you know, even three megaparsec or four megaparsec location, you have like a 20% chance to see it. But that's not very interesting because that's so much background and you have to cross the finger a lot. So if you want to see you know, several neutrinos, let's say three neutrinos, then you want to have supernova pretty much at Andromeda. So we, we have a still, um, we have a megaparsec view, but really interesting is to reach around a four megaparsec, then you cover so much galaxies. But up to this uh, M81, we don't have many target. So, so anyway, that's how you read these plots. Super, super. Thank you so much. Let's see, we have, we have a lot of, of, of questions. Um, so the next question comes from Peranava Teja. What is the energy threshold of super K and what is the expected thresholds for hyper K? The question is primarily in the context of looking for supernova neutrinos. Okay, so supernova neutrino, we always assume 10, 10 MeV. Um, so the detail is a bit complicated. Um, because solar neutrino, we assume lower. We assume like a four or five MeV. Um, so that's the energy threshold is. Um, well, sorry, and, and, and also we, it's a challenging. So a lot of hyperarchy development is focusing on oscillation. And we are a little bit, uh, I, I would say sacrificing low energy physics, I have to say. So that's why this uh, dark rate, for example. So we have a new PMT which has a twice more quantum efficiency, but the dark rate is higher. So which means you have a better measurement for oscillation or GeV neutrinos, but if you want to do solar neutrinos, it's a challenging. So we are working on to make this dark rate lower. And also photocathode coverage is now is, uh, not enough. So we are developing new device. Uh, so that's uh, how we try to reach to this uh, target for MEB threshold for solar neutrino, then we can see this uh, upturn you know, of the MSW. And supernova, yeah, we already assume 10 MeV and uh, I, I don't know much detail of this. Let's go on to more questions. Um, so let's see. Um, William Thompson is thanking you for the talk. 
and it's asking how is a PID discriminator in Super K defined? Okay, so that's uh, uh, <laughs> I, I skipped completely. So this is very complicated part, but the the, the quick explanation is uh, so this likelihood is used to all information of timing and the charge of all PMT. So the light profile of all detector uh, is compared with the two assumptions. One is uh, uh, electron-like and other is muon-like. And then that's so likely for the best um, discrimination, discriminator. Um, it's very similar with the uh, other Cherenko detector is using, especially Miniboom. Actually, it's a, but I, I don't know. That, uh, so yeah, it's a likelihood based time and charge likelihood. Okay, great. Uh, we have another one from Edgar Chavarria, who's asking uh, why is a Cherenkov scattered ring, is, why is it sharper for Nui? And what would happen if you would have a new tau? Ah, okay. So I might have this uh, figure on the background. So that the reason is because of the electromagnetic shower. So the case of a muon neutrino, so you make a sharp ring, but uh, electron neutrino produce electron. So first process is electron has a multiple scattering. So the trajectory is not a straight. And the second thing is there's an electromagnetic shower production. So the ring edge has a more blur comparing with the muon. And the tau, so tau is a problem for this community. So the, because we are not very high energy, but well, tau, tau is a problem for everyone. So tau decay to a multiple hadrons and the main channel is to like a three pion or four pion. And uh, it's very unclear signal. So we use a neural network to find, and yeah, we, we do claim this three sigma excess of tau event, but from the event display, it's impossible to tell it's tau, it's just a neutral current or not. Super, fantastic. Let's see, let's continue. Um, so Mario Andres Acer Ortega asks, what uh, would the exclusion confidence level be for delta CP equal pi? Um, I'm not sure if I understand the question. Um, yep. So delta CP equal pi, am I right? It's also, also mean delta CP equal zero. Yeah, he's asking for pi. Okay, so, so there are a way to, uh, the, the community has a two way to describe uh, Delta CP and uh, super K, T2K terminology. Uh, we always consider from uh, uh, zero and uh, um, so the both the left side minus and the right side positive. So the pi is uh, here. And yeah, so that was not excluded. So zero is here and the pi is there. Yeah, it's both neither are excluded. Um, it's, it is excluded one sigma by any three sigma, it's not excluded. Uh, and it's a number, I, I don't remember. So the zero is excluded with the two sigma. Um, I, I don't remember how much for the, this side is excluded. So since, since we are talking about that, um, I mean, you, you showed on your initial slides that uh, basically um, uh, having a zero or, 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 a, or a pi would uh, shift the location of the, of the peak. So, so I guess that with more data, you would be able to, to distinguish that better by, uh, by doing say a finer binning, would that be possible? Um, I, I don't think the binning really affect. I think it's really um, just statistics. So now we have this, at least we have a closed contour. So expectation is higher statistics will find the value. And uh, yeah, three sigma rejection of zero. So I, I think I, I'm expecting three sigma rejection of zero and the pi is maybe similar 
which mean it will happen uh, um, before hyper -K, I think. So the T2K upgrade, and if you improve the static systematics, you can reject um, zero with uh, three sigma. So I'm expecting maybe that's the same time with pi is ex 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 excluded because our best fit is around minus pi over two. But of course, if you have a more data, this uh, best fit point shift. So the rejection sensitivity of zero and pi are not equal. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Let's see if there are any other, I think that there are no more questions. We did it. Everybody's thanking you. Thanking you, interesting no question. question. Thank you very no. much for the talk. Is there a question from the audience? Yes, I have a question. Uh, first of all, uh, very, very nice your, your talk. I like it a lot. But I, I wanted to ask you, what is the capability of hyper candidate for the to, to detect or to get some constraints or something related with the neutrinos coming from dark matter annihilation or dark matter decay? Um, so yeah, we have uh, some sensitivity plots. I didn't include this time. Um, it's good. <laughs> Uh, so the, uh, the, the energy, um, we can reach to all the way to TV. So we have a very unique sensitivity for this, uh, the point source. Uh, I think that's already super K demonstrate, but hyper K will be better. I, I don't remember any numbers for this though. So, but in principle there are, there is, there would be an improvement with respect to it. Oh yes, it's uh, it's a bigger and uh, yeah, it's a higher statistics and uh, um, extended energy, you know, for the high energy. So. Ah, great, great. And uh, another very short question, but because we, here you in the slide that you're presenting now, it, there is the supernova neutrinos and the mega parser distance. So that means with this plot that if there is any galact uh, galact locally located supernova that produces like the 1987 supernova neutrino, you would get a lot of uh, signal oh, yeah. information yeah. on, I mean, the, the, the number yeah. of neutrinos that you would detect with a very nearby source is gonna be enormous, no? Yeah, so the gal galactic supernova, if that happened, that'd be great. Um, we expect a thousand of events and uh, the timing information is also great. So you can study all you know, how do you call it, the CESI or the you know, oscillation, uh, not, not neutrino oscillation, but also this acoustic oscillation of the material or, you know, so there are all kinds of studies going on, but uh, it's just, uh, you know, we have to be lucky for this, <laughs> so. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's why this uh, extension of review is very interesting. So four megaparsec is a kind of uh, benchmark then you see supernova neutrino every day. Uh, sorry, every year. So you don't have to cross your finger anymore. Okay, I don't think we have any other questions. Let me check. Um, uh, yes, oh, we, yes, we do have more questions. <laughs> so um, let's see, Alexander Arguello Quiroga. In order to get the number of event distribution, how many d years did you use in the simulations? And what about the value of the efficiency of the detector? Uh, um, so the, the, the Monte Carlo we use, I only know this uh, near detector, is roughly 10 times. So we use a 10 times more Monte Carlo statistics than data in terms of year. Um, and the efficiency of a super K, uh, I shouldn't. I should know this number. I don't remember now. Um, yeah, it's it not. It's like a typical efficiency, like let's say twenty percent to fifty percent. It's not like five percent. Great, thank you. Um, I have. I have one last question. Uh, so, so since you are uh, in your results, including information from reactor uh, data, uh, are there any plans to also use information from NOVA who, who, who are doing, uh, I mean, they're doing similar things? 
So that's a, a, a very good point. And we do have a team working on joint fit. So eventually, Nova and the T2K will do a joint fit and uh, working together to provide the oscillation result. I just don't know when we can reach this point, but that will be uh, really uh, great because we have a different beam and uh, um, so Nova has a more sensitivity for matter effect. So you have a great result for mass, you know, the mass hierarchy and CP, delta CP simultaneously. So yes, we are working on this, but it takes a while. Yeah. Okay, thanks, good, good to know. Uh, so I think that's it. The chat is uh, finally silent. We, we've already done this for one hour and 15 minutes. Oh no, we have another question. What's this? Oh no, it's Alejandro who is repeating the web, last one from the chat. Okay, so um, uh, on behalf of the of the Los Physics webinar, we'd like to, to thank you quite a lot uh, from, for, for giving the talk. It's been great and your answers have been fantastic. Um, and well, I'd like to, before finishing this, I'd like to, to remind uh, the audience that we will have okay. uh, another talk soon, uh, not on neutrinos, but on axions, I think, by Luca Vicinelli. Uh, very soon you can check all the dates of all of our webinars on uh, our web page, right? So look for us in Google if you don't know it, Low Physics Webinars. Okay, so that's it. Uh, thank you uh, very much once again and see you all very soon. I'm ending it.